Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Mover Mailbag. I uh, hope you guys are having a great week. If you'd like to send me something for the Mover Mailbag, C.W. Lemoyne at cwlemoyne.com, facebook.com slash C.W. Lemoyne. Uh, Instagram, you can follow me at C.W. Lemoyne, but probably not the best place because uh, anything that's not in my contacts ends up going to the other folder and uh, I rarely uh, get to do that. If you want to mail me something, P.O. Box 8594, Manville, Louisiana, 70470. All right, so let's get right to it. First uh, email slash question comes from Aaron. Hi, CW. I just wanted to say that for a guy on the doorstep of 40, it took me a long time to learn that you must make them tell you no. As an extremely shy child, I unwittingly formed the habit of self-elimination from a young age. The message you are sending is so important in life, not just becoming a pilot. I love planes and the Viper in particular, so hats off to you and all your accomplishments. I'm working through your videos, so I may be premature in mentioning this idea, but how about a video and call signs and how you get them? I read Eye of the Viper by Peter Alashir uh, years ago, and he touched on it, but I think it's a good topic for your channel, very respectfully, Aaron in Eastern North Carolina. Okay, so call signs. Fighter pilot call signs are just nicknames. That's what we use. Uh, it's a tradition that goes back uh, very long, and it typically in the Air Force, uh, which is what I'll talk about specifically, uh, it involves a naming ceremony and it is usually based on either a play on your first or last name or uh, more commonly you've done something. It's a funny story, either you've done something stupid, you've done something cool, uh, something that's got a good story. Typically has rules associated with it, like it can't be something ridiculous that you can't you know, yell across the uh, Nellis O Club bar like douche canoe. You don't wanna say, hey douche canoe, give me another one. Not gonna work. So uh, there are rules associated. You get call signs in pilot training, but it's usually, I don't know if they still do it, but it's usually just a quick little naming ceremony. Your instructor pilots come up with a, a name for you and then uh, it sticks with you for pilot training and then you go to the B course, which is the F-16 for me, basic course. Uh, and they give you another naming, the IPs, you know, funny stories, something you've done, something, uh, or based, like I said, based off your last name. Uh, and then you go to your combat squadron, your first actual fighter squadron, and you're usually like FNG or the Makos, it was CHUM, uh, some generic call sign, FNG1, FNG2, etc. cetera, uh, NITS. Uh, as another example. And then after a while you finish your mission qualification training and the bros of the squadron, which again is not inclusive to just guys, it's guys and girls, it's a generic term, uh, will get together and they'll start coming up with ideas for names for you. They'll come up with a board and they'll say, hey, you know, he did this, here's a funny story, she did this, here's a funny story, or here's a play off their last name. And then once, once they all you know, are, are happy with that, they'll schedule a naming ceremony. A naming ceremony is kind of like a roll call, and even though in the politically correct, correct world of 2019, uh, it's kind of been watered down from what it used to be, uh, it's still Fight Club. And the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. So there's some things in the fighter pilot experience that you're just gonna have to live yourself. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about kind of what goes on there. People have gotten in trouble in the past for stupid names. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it in the news or things that have happened there. Uh, that is not the standard. It's usually uh, uh, just a fun time and a good thing for camaraderie. But uh, it is a naming ceremony to get together and it's a fighter pilot tradition. And at the end of the day, uh, you get your God-given fighter pilot call sign and that call sign can stick with you uh, throughout the rest of your career. I've been mover since I was a lieutenant and it can, uh, be changed if you do something really stupid at the next naming you could get a hostile renaming uh, or uh, if you haven't you, typically you get to keep your call sign if you've flown in combat with it or at least two different commands but uh, if if you have done something really dumb there is a chance you can get a hostile renaming but otherwise it sticks with you that's not to be confused with a flying call sign which sometimes squadrons have uh, standard call signs they all fly with, like uh, you know, the River Rattlers. We were River Flight. 
uh, or the Makos where Mako or Shark or Akula or something like that. But some squadrons actually have a whole list of call signs they can use and they'll do what's called a call sign auction. And that will go, the Snacko will make a little bit of money uh, for just for a party or something, uh, snacks and stuff. And the pilots will uh, bid on the call signs they want and there'll, there'll be an auction and they'll get to fly with that call sign until the next auction. So like right now I'm flying with race one because that's what I bid on because I like racing, you know, and that was the closest thing, you know, especially getting the Corvette and all that stuff. So, uh, second part of that, uh, a lot of people have asked how I became mover and how I got that call sign and mine's based on a story. So I actually told that story on the first, uh, episode of Mondays with Mover. So here's one year younger me telling the story of how I became mover. A lot of people ask me, why are you mover? How is that your call sign? You know, CW Lemoyne mover, it's on the uh, airplanes and stuff. Uh, that's my call sign. That's what I was named when I was flying F-16s in the Air Force Reserve. Back when I first got out of the B course, 2008, I was strafing at Avon Park. We were doing uh, spin-ups for Iraq. We were about to go to deploy to Iraq for Iraq, Iraqi freedom in 2009. And what happened was we went to the range <laughs> and I had been used to flying with the Lantern Pod, which is not a great pod compared to the, at the time, the Lightning uh, AT and with the with the lantern pod sometimes you'd have like a tactical bush is what we'd call it you know some some bush out in the desert that would retain some heat and you know it would glow white hot black hot but you know it, it really wasn't anything and we were out strafing uh, we had live bullets 20 millimeter we were strafing a convoy uh, with actual JTACs they gave us type 3 control which means we don't have to you know clear it hot cleared um, I don't have to get a cleared hot every time. Uh, it's a target array we were going after, uh, the convoy. And what happened was we strafed, and I saw a bunch of little blobs on the screen. I didn't think anything of it because I was used to, you know, training. And when we came back, and this jet had DVR, so instead of the 8mm tapes, it was actually high-fidelity stuff. And when I came back, the um, we blew it up on the screen, and those tactical blobs actually had legs. And there were a lot of them. And as the 20 millimeter bullets hit the target, they exploded because they were cows. It was a herd of cows, like a moo cows. So uh, mover, like, you know, moo cow. And uh, also it was a 3-1 term for uh, a moving object or a moving uh, vehicle or something and not associated with the objective uh, that is moving in the vicinity. So uh, that stuck mover. And uh, I've been that since 2009 when they named me uh, based off that story. And then from there, uh, I've been, you know, Air Force, Navy, F-16, F-18, so. So anyway, that's uh, call signs in a nutshell. Uh, it's a really good tradition. You know, it's, it's more of a fighter thing. And, and also, you know, not only is it the camaraderie, but, you know, there's also a little bit of the uh, a tactical application because over the radio you say, hey, mover, instead of your name. Now the enemy doesn't know your, your real name. So it's kind of a, uh, there is some background behind that too. All right, uh, next question. Next question comes from Noah. Hi, Mover. My name is Noah and I've been watching your videos for many months now and I've learned so much about becoming a fighter pilot from you. I just graduated high school and I'm strongly considering joining the Air Force after I finish college. You've made it seem like a much less daunting process and I appreciate it very much. I know you get a lot of repetitive questions, so I wanted to ask something nobody has asked. How do fighter bomber pilots use the bathroom on really long missions that require multiple refuelings and many hours of air time, especially if it's an emergency? Uh, so, the answer is piddle packs. Actually, uh, I talked about piddle packs in the first uh, episode, so here that is as well. Um, coming out of IFF, uh, Intro to Fighter Fundamentals, which is the last T-38 before you go to your, uh, your following aircraft, the F-16 for me. I had some time, so I got to the squadron and I wanted to sandbag. You know, so that's sitting in the back seat as they do missions, you know, if the D model is available. And so I went to uh, to fly one of these missions, and uh, the the T-38 that I had come from, uh, step, which is you know getting dressed, putting all the G suit and all that stuff on to start, maybe 30 minutes, uh, and that's what I was used to. So I I'd never really you know thought about any considerations whatsoever physiologically. And so my very first time, uh, we were doing an air-to-ground mission. I was riding in the back seat. It's called Basic Surface Attack. So we're going, uh, flying out to the range and dropping the BDU-33s, uh, so these little 33-pound bombs, essentially, with, with uh, charges. And um, step to start, or I'm sorry, step to takeoff was a little under an hour. 
And I didn't really consider that. So I, going back to the centrifuge thing, I was worried about uh, G tolerance and being able to pull G's because I was scared to death that I was going to go get an F-16, ride in the back, and G-lock, G-induced loss of consciousness, pass out and wash out you know, an RDB. Uh, it's called G-cap uh, prior to even showing up uh, for day one of class. So I was drinking a lot of water. And you can kind of see where this story's going. So, um, you know, use the bathroom before I leave, get to the end of runway where they have to arm up everything, and it's been an hour, and I've got to pee. So I'm like, okay, you know, it's no big deal. I don't really know what to expect. And we take off, and finally, you know, I start to, you know, as we're driving, drone into the airspace, I ask the guy in front, I go, hey, you got a piddle pack. Well, if you're wondering what a piddle pack is, it's one of these, and it's a lifesaver. It's a... Pilot relief bag, powder, it's a little bag, this one's really old, the powder's turned brown, but it's a little bag that you pee in, and this turns into gel, and you put it back uh, in the bag, and you can throw it away when you're done. No problem, doesn't stop you, right? So I asked the guy, hey, you got a piddle pack, because I'm thinking maybe he can pass one, because I didn't even know where to get one, I was brand new. And he goes, no, sure don't. Okay, well, I can hold it. I go, well, how long do you think we have left? Uh, oh, we've got, you know, another hour and a half left. Okay, I can handle it. Well, as we're driving to the range, knowing I can't go pee, it gets worse. And so I'm sitting in silence in the back seat, contemplating the rest of my life, because I don't know if I can hold it. And we do the G warm-up, and now it's starting, you know, the G suit inflates, and it's pushing right on my butt or something. Oh God, this hurts. So I'm going through all these scenarios in my mind. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I can, you know, I'll pee my pants. Well, I can't really pee my pants. Okay, well, you know, I'll pee in the helmet bag. No, yeah, that's probably not going to hold it. Okay, well, I really got to go and, you know, maybe I'll cut my G suit open and pee in it. No, that's not going to work. So, you know, I, I went through all the progression of, you know, to the point of I'm going to pull the handle and jump out and pee on a cactus out here in, in Phoenix because it's getting that bad. So we go through the mission and, you know, every time he rolls in, the G-suit inflates. So I finally just unplug the thing and I'm sitting back there in immense amounts of pain to the point where, you know, all I'm thinking about is, oh, my God, I've got to get back. So we finally finish the mission and we're going back and I barely, you know, unstrap run to the bathroom, you know, I'm thinking, oh my God, I've just given myself cancer. And, you know, had to pee so bad, finally make it to the bathroom barely, you know, and it's, I'm spasming and, you know, I feel so much better. And that's why I never fly without one of these. It's so the other thing, uh, you know, pedal packs are great for number one. I used to, you know, when I was in Iraq, go to the tanker. Uh, we'd do a six hour mission and about every hour or so we'd hit the tanker, come back and do our thing. And that was my routine. I'd hit the tanker, uh, drink some Gatorade and eat a cliff bar and hit the pedal pack and repeat because it's just break the boredom. And uh, you kind of just needed something to do. Plus I had to pee. That's really easy to answer. For number two, uh, you're in a fighter. That's gonna suck. Um, I've heard of people getting creative, uh, including using like their lunch bag. I've heard of their lunch box. I've heard of uh, helmet bags. I've heard of all kind of disgusting ways, but when you have to go and it's emergency, uh, I've personally never had to do that. The closest I've ever come, which is a very embarrassing story, was uh, one of my last flights on the Hornet, taking off to go drop bombs. Um, spicy hot wings hit me right as I was hitting EOR and my flight lead broke. So I had to wait and then I ended up flying single ship, taking off. And as soon as I got airborne, I just, it was, things were about to happen. So uh, I told Approach I was RTB and then went straight to base to final, landed, and made it to the bathroom just in time because um, there's really nothing you can do. And, you know, when, when you got to go, you got to go. So, uh, yeah, that's not the best of places to have that happen. I think bombers, some of them actually have some little small makeshift bathroom or whatever. But, uh, yeah, you either have pedal packs or you have to get creative. There's really nothing else you can do about that. For the final thing, I always say something nice. This is actually a no kidding uh, package from Lynn, uh, one of my top fans on Facebook. If you're not following me on Facebook, I've got a book discussion group that uh, is pretty cool. We like to talk about the books if you like books. So here you go. Uh, she sent this. It's got paws on it, and it's got a nice card that says mover, 
And on the back, it's right here. I don't know if you can see that. It says, you're a great writer and I enjoy Mondays with Mover. Um, it says, you're the best dog dad in the world. Don't, uh, hey boys, come here, Kaiser. Uh, save this box to prop up your Christmas tree better. Yeah, that's true. For the window next season, happy Father's Day. Oh, it's Father's Day. I guess mail takes some time. So there's a book, Harold and the Purple Crayon. Come here, boys. Come here, you got a present. Come here. Come here. Come here, Kaiser. Come here. Hey. Hey, you want this? There you go. Sniper's stuck over there. And what else did you get? Best dog dad ever. Here. You, can, you, you want this? Yeah. You can have that. And Clifford the Big Red Dog. Well, thanks, Lynn. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being a fan of the channel. Thanks for sending this stuff. It really means a lot. Uh, Sniper, who is not on camera. I don't know if Kaiser is on camera either, but he's right here. Um, anyway. They like it. And once again, thanks, Lynn, for uh, the... Um, package. Sorry that part is a little bit blurry. Um, I've had to film this twice because figuring out this Panasonic, Panasonic Lumix camera has been a uh, pain in the ass and sometimes the videos are blurry and I'm on the borderline of losing the entire video because it's just too blurry and it looks like I'm in the witness protection program but uh, trying to figure that out. But uh, if you have anything for the mover mailbag, cwlemoyne, cwlemoyne.com, facebook.com slash cwlemoyne, and uh, I will try to answer your questions. And if you want to send me something, like Lynn was very nice to do, P.O. Box 8594, Mandeville, Louisiana, 70470. I think 70471 will work, too. Uh, a note on sending, asking questions and stuff like that. I get a lot of questions a day, and I would love to answer all your questions. But there are very good resources out there for you. Bogeydope.com is one I recommend. Uh, highly recommend. FlyingSquadron.com slash forms, which is baseops.net. Highly recommend. AirWarriors.com, if you're looking for Navy stuff, highly recommend. And the reason for that is, as a fighter pilot or a pilot in general, credibility, humble, credible, and approachable is a big thing in your career. And you have to be able to take the initiative. You have to be able to do the research on your own. You have to be able to do that legwork. And there's nothing worse than having someone show up to a brief unprepared because they just don't know. And and they have, they're asking questions that they should know. A lot of the generic questions I won't answer and can't answer just because of the volume of questions I have because I've answered them before. They've been on the videos. Uh, you can Google them, bogeydope.com, all that stuff. All that information is there, like uh, how does the pilot uh, the track select process work? How do you pick what aircraft? What's OTS? All that stuff. You should be able to look those answers up and not ask the very basic questions on, on how to become a fighter pilot. I have a playlist uh, called The Road to Wings on the page. I recommend you check that out because I've answered a lot of that before and look through the archives. Spend a little bit of time and you'll see that your questions have already been answered. If your question hasn't been answered, I absolutely have no problem answering it and trying to help out the best I can. For medical stuff, I am not a flight surgeon. Um, I will try to get a flight surgeon on the channel eventually, but as of right now I don't have any medical training or background and I don't know so my recommendation if your question is whether your specific medical condition will be waived or not I just I can't answer all I know is from my experience I got a waiver and I was successful and all you can do is keep pushing and make them tell you no and until no one else uh, can answer that question uh, keep pushing until there's no one else that can tell you no um, if you use a YouTube video to crush your hopes and dreams, you're probably wrong. I mean, even though I try to give you the best and most accurate information, I, it's just that's just the way it is. I, YouTube is not the be-all, end-all, so don't rely on a YouTube video uh, for your answers. Go find it yourself. FlyingSquadron.com has an aviation medicine forum that has flight docs that answer, so uh, that's a good place, good resource. I'm not trying to discourage anyone. I'm not trying to crush anyone's hopes and dreams. The, I just, you know, I, I don't want people to think I'm ignoring them and I don't want people to think, well, uh, obviously I can't do it because Mover didn't answer my questions. 
there's a lot of information out there uh, and at the end of the day you just have to try it you just have to keep pushing forward and you have to make them tell you no that's that's the only way to, to be, succeed in this business so anyway hope you guys enjoyed it thanks for watching and i will see you next time